morning, church. We're continuing our study through the Gospel of Luke, and this morning that brings us to chapter 18. That's where we're going to pick up this morning in verse 1. But just by way of recap, if you weren't with us, uh, last week we, we finished out chapter 17 looking at what it meant when Jesus said the kingdom of God was among them or in their midst. Uh, we were looking at how to be watching warning, praying, and obeying as we wait for the, the Lord to take us home to, to complete the work that He has begun and to prepare for that day. Well, in the midst of that, as Jesus is explaining to these disciples that uh, He will return one day, that He will establish His kingdom finally once and for all, and that they should be ready, that they should be watching for it and praying and, and walking in obedience in the midst of that. He's going to give them a parable to express exactly what they should be doing. And that's where we pick up Luke chapter 18, beginning verse 1. Here's what we read. Then He spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart saying, There was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. Now there was a widow in that city, and she came to him, saying, Get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. Then the Lord said, Hear what that unjust judge said. And shall not God avenge His own elect, who cry out day and night to Him, though He bears long with them? I tell you that He will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will He really find faith on the earth? Lord, as we open Your Word this morning, God, as we look at this parable that Jesus gave to the disciples and for us this morning to learn from and hear as well, God, would You speak to us? Lord, there's not a person in this room that cannot um, benefit from this. God, there's not a person in this room uh, that doesn't have room for growth and correction and instruction in our lives. And Lord, we look to you for that. It's your word, your spirit, your power that we need this morning. So would you speak to us for your glory and for our good? And it's in your name, Jesus, that we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Well, if you're taking notes, you could write down this title this morning, The Prayerable. That's what we're looking at this morning, The Prayerable. Nothing too complicated about it. We are looking at a parable about prayer, so I just mashed them together for you and made a sandwich. There's your word for the day. Today, Jesus gives the disciple this parable. Now, if you're unfamiliar with that term, if the term parable means absolutely nothing to you, don't worry. Uh, it, it's common in Scripture, but if you're not familiar with the Bible, it's probably not a word you use in every day around the store or the house or at work. A parable simply means to throw alongside or to come alongside something. And what it was is Jesus would give them a story, an illustration of something they could understand and then he would compare it. He would bring alongside it a heavenly truth, something they couldn't really understand. And we do this all the time, especially if you have children at home, where they may ask you something and you're going, okay, how do I explain this to a child, right? Well, I can't really explain all of that to you. It's over your head, but let me find something simple you do understand, and I'll compare it to that. And now the child goes, oh, I get it. Well, that's what Jesus does to the crowds, often with the disciples, is he takes this, this heavenly truth, this reality that exists in his kingdom. He's going, now how do I explain this to these knuckleheads, right? Like, how do, how do I break this down in such a way that it can make sense to them? 
and He gives them a story. Often it's stories around a seed and a sower or a tree or, or an illustration like this of an interaction that would take place commonly in their day. That they'd go, oh yeah, we, we've seen this before. We know how that works. And then He would say, now here's how it works in my kingdom and would kind of flip the script for them for a moment and would show them how there's this heavenly reality that exists that now they can comprehend in a better way. So that's a parable, and that's what he's doing here with this parable on prayer. He's given them a story of an unjust judge and a widow, and that interaction is going to help the disciples and us, by extension, better understand how prayer works and how we are to interact with God within it. Now, he's doing something in the way he's sharing this parable. He's, he's using a bit of an argument from lesser to greater, so that if you can look at the first example within his parable and see how that makes sense, then how much more so the greater example he will give. So, if, if a widow can get the result she wants from an unjust judge who doesn't care about God or her, how much more so can God's children come to him and receive answers and help in their time of need through prayer. But it's a text that is using contrast and not comparison. I don't want you to walk away today saying, okay, so God's like an unjust judge. He doesn't fear God. He doesn't respect me. And if I want something from Him, I need to annoy Him like this lady did the judge. It's all wrong. He's using a contrast to show If she could get it from this guy who doesn't care about her, how much more, in contrast, a just God who is loving, who is kind, who knows what you need before you even ask. And here's one of my favorite things about this parable, is that Luke gives you the answer before he even starts it. Anytime you read a parable, you need to be asking yourself, what's the point of it, right? What's the point of this parable? What is Jesus trying to say with what he's saying here? And Luke's like, I'm going to keep it simple for you guys. There's going to be no confusion. He says, He spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. Okay, the teacher just gave you the answer to the test before you took the test. So, there it is for you. Plain and clear, Luke's writing this saying, okay, now Jesus gave a parable. Here's why he gave this parable I'm about to explain. So that men would always pray and not lose heart. That's the two-pronged purpose of this parable. Jesus wanted His disciples, in light of the time they were living in and knowing what awaited them in their future, He wanted them to be praying. And He didn't want them to lose heart in that prayerfulness. So the first character that Jesus gives them in this parable that points to prayer is an unjust judge. We're told that there was a certain city, in a certain city, a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. This is a man in authority, a man with power, a man with a responsibility to be looking out for the well-being of the people within that city to be fighting for justice, to be acting with compassion, to be filled with love and discernment. And yet, we're told, this man with power and authority, the one who's meant to solve the problems, he doesn't fear God, and he doesn't have any regard or respect for man. I mean, I can't think of two more important things for someone in that position than that they would fear God and that they would respect man. Because if he doesn't fear God, the ultimate source of truth and authority and morality, how is he going to be a righteous, just judge? What's he going to base it off of? And if he doesn't respect man around him, is he really going to seek justice for others at whatever the cost with as much time and energy and effort as it might take? Or is this just going to be a headache for him, a pain, and he's only going to do what he prefers to do? Now, the fact that he doesn't fear God is a red flag not only because of his position, but in general all together. 
Proverbs would say that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Now, beware of any person with any kind of authority who doesn't fear God and doesn't respect man. Proverbs 3.27 says this, Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in the power of your hand to do so. Now, this city judge in Jesus' parable has the power to do so. He can fix the problem at hand for this widow. And yet, he doesn't fear God nor his word. He does not respect or care for this woman. And he's withholding good that is within his power to accomplish. As believers, this should never be said of us. We should be the most God-fearing, most man-respecting people on earth. Those two go hand in hand. I hope you know that. If you don't fear God, you will never respect man made in the image of God. But if you love and fear God, you will by default respect and treat with kindness and love those around you, especially in the faith. And in 1 John chapter 4, and I love such strong language in 1 John that's used, but it just paints it out very black and white for you. This is what it says. If someone says, I love God, and there's a lot of people that say that, right? But here's the litmus test. It says, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? I mean, could you, could you be any more blunt and clear than that? I love God, okay, but you hate your brother? How does that work? Because God is love, and God has called you to love your neighbor as yourself. So, riddle me that. And here in our text, we see a man, he doesn't fear God, and by default, he does not respect or love and care for those around him. But you know, if we're not careful, we can very quickly find ourselves in a similar place. Just because you love God, and maybe deep down you truly do love others, doesn't mean you don't still have a sinful nature with a flesh that is weak and an ability to very quickly stop loving God, stop respecting those around you especially in our extremely sensitive, highly hostile political climate, I see very little respect given to our fellow man, especially if they think, look, or vote differently than us. Oh, I respect you, and I love you, and I'll, I'll look out for you until I hear how you voted <laughs> or until I hear what post you shared or until I hear that, that conversation and which side of it you landed on, and now I have absolutely no respect for you. Now, we should take the challenge to heart that First Peter chapter 2 gives us. Just, once again, simple, clear, direct. It says this, Honor all people. Love the brotherhood. Fear God and honor the king. Pretty clear, isn't it? Honor all people. Well, what if they vote differently? Honor all people. Yeah, but you don't know what they said. Honor all people. And I know every one of you could think of someone right now in your mind. You're like, they're the exception to that rule. When 1 Peter chapter 2 was written, they weren't walking the earth. God has called you to honor all people. That doesn't mean you agree with all people. That doesn't mean you excuse or ignore sin in all people, but all people you are called to honor. Love the brotherhood, the family of God. Do you know how they'll know us? By our love for one another. Fear God. There it is again. These two go hand in hand. And honor the king. You're like, check that box. No king over me. First of all, you serve the king of kings you're called to honor, but secondly, you still have authority over you. 
not just in this country, but even in this state. And I can see you squirming in your chair. Honor all people. But this judge in this city did not. And here's the woman who is brought before him with her case. We're told she was a widow and she's seeking justice from her adversary. Now, Jesus could have picked any scenario, but he was very specific and intentional by choosing a woman who is a widow who has an adversary coming before a judge. Because understand, in the culture they lived in, women did not have the same respect, authority, or power, or voice as a man did. On top of that, When a woman is then married, now she has a husband who can fight for her, who can protect her, who can be a voice for her. Well, she's widowed, so she no longer has that husband in her corner to help support her, to help back her, to protect her. And she has an adversary that is against her, and we're not told the details of it. It doesn't matter. She's going before a judge as a woman in a culture didn't have a lot of authority or power or a voice who now does not have a husband fighting or protecting her either, and she's got someone actively against her. Do you see the picture he's trying to paint through this? Someone who is helpless. Someone who is in need of someone stronger and more capable than themselves to come along and help them. That's why she goes to the judge. That's why she goes to the one who does have power and authority over that city, the one who can avenge her from her adversary, the one who can bring about a change for her situation. And though the description of the unjust judge is not a good comparison with God, the description of this widow And her situation is spot on in describing our reality, isn't it? First and foremost, spiritually, I hope you realize that we were helpless without the Lord. There's a very real adversary we face as well, the devil, the enemy. And if you think, yeah, but I've kind of got it on my own, you're wrong. You are helpless against him in your own strength. And he is coming against you and you have no defense on your own and you can't possibly get yourself out of this situation. And so the the wise thing to do in the same way we see this widow acting is to go, who can fight for me? Who does have power and authority over this adversary? Who can fight on my behalf and bring about the victory I couldn't get on my own? The judge. But when we think about the the scenario Jesus has laid out in this parable, it becomes even more helpless because now the only person she has hope in is a judge who we're told doesn't respect her, doesn't fear God, has no moral compass. It's hopeless. But she goes before him anyway. And it says that he would not for a while She goes to him, here's my case, I need you to fight for me, I need you to bring justice here, and he's, oh my gosh, I don't have time for this, go away. She comes back again the next day, I need you to help me with this, I have an adversary against me, I have no one to defend me, I'm here, you're the judge of this city, go away. The next day, what's on my calendar? Oh my gosh, she's back again. And he wouldn't help her until, we're told, he said within himself, though I don't fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her lest by her continual coming she weary me. He's like, okay, you know what? This problem is not going away. She's going to be here every day until I do something about this. And so he resolves to say, you know what, I'm going to help her. Not because I care about her. Not because I want justice in this city. Just because I want her to stop coming before me. She's wearying me. So I'm going to do what she needs just to get rid of her. I'm going to fix the problem so it goes away. 
He only avenged her so that he might be rid of her. Now, as quickly as we want to condemn this judge for his actions right here, we need to ask a question. You need to allow Scripture to be a mirror for a moment and ask yourself the hard question, are you and I approaching problems that those around us are facing in the exact same way? When you have a family member, a friend, a coworker, a brother or sister in Christ who continue to share about this problem that exists in their life, do you and I approach it the exact same way this judge does and you go, oh my gosh, I can't listen to this anymore. I just need to figure out a solution so they'll stop talking about it, so I don't have to hear about it anymore. Are we only helping them so that we can get away from them? Because this kind of mindset, like what the judge has here, it often only addresses the superficial issue without spending the time to truly dig in and get to the root of the issue to help bring lasting change in their life. Instead of sitting down with them and asking the question, what's really going on here? And how can I truly help? And how can we bring about lasting change? We're like, oh my gosh, I don't want to hear about it anymore. I know you have these problems here. Let me just throw some money at it. Let me just direct you towards somebody else. Let me just try and get you out of my hair and push you on someone else who may actually help with the problem. We can do that, can't we? I can do that. But the heart of the gospel, the heart of God, and the heart He calls everyone who follows Him as a disciple to carry is one of compassion, self-sacrificial love, and service. And it's demonstrated through Jesus who didn't just try and shoot down a little band-aid for our problem of sin. He said, I don't want to hear about your suffering. I'll give you some things to comfort you. Figure it out. No, He comes down into our mess. He makes our problem His own. And then He pays for it to solve the problem for us and bring lasting change. So let me ask you, is that the way that you address the problems of those around you? Do you make their problem your own? Do you jump into the mess with them? Do you seek to serve them and care for them and pour out your life so that you might bring lasting change for them? Because that's the heart of God. That's the heart He's called us to have. But here we see a judge who cares little for this woman, just wants the problem to go away. So he says, all right, you know what? She's wearying me. She's wearing me down. I'm a parent of three, almost four children now, and I know how well a a child can wear you down, right? Can I have it? No. They walk away and five minutes later, can I please have it? Can I please, please, please have it? No. Can I please, 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 he said, oh my, okay, you can have it, just go away, right? Well, this woman has worn this man down to the core, and he says, all right, I'm going to avenge her just so she goes away. And then Jesus says, now hear what he said. He breaks out of the parable for, her, for this moment. He looks to the disciples says, listen to what he said. Did you hear that? Did you get that? He avenged her because she wearied him, because she probably annoyed him. He didn't fear God. He didn't respect her, but he did avenge her. Even this guy who didn't care about anyone else brought justice to this woman because of her persistence. And he says, now shall not God, or how much more so, Will a just judge who loves you, who cares deeply about the problem, avenge you? If a sinful man would do it, how much more God? Now, we already saw something similar to this expressed in Luke chapter 11. When Jesus said to them, if a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? 
Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? And you're thinking, well, of course not. He says, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? You see the progression of going, well, no, obviously, like, of course we would give a good gift to our child. We're not, we're not heartless. We care about him. He says, okay, and you're sinful, and you're wicked, and you have a flesh, and there are times you don't want to give even to those you love because it requires something of you. But how much more God who is love, God who is a good heavenly Father, who is perfect in all His ways, how much more so will He give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? And in our text here, He says, it makes sense to you. You hear that story and you go, yeah, I mean, the guy's a no good, filthy sinner. He doesn't care about anyone but himself, but it makes sense. The lady kept coming back and he's like, you know what? I give in. He's like, so if you think she could still get justice from him, why are you stopping praying and seeking the Lord for justice? Or why are you losing heart in your prayerfulness to the Lord? Are you really so foolish? And thinking that he doesn't care about the situation, that he doesn't care about you. But you believe this situation, where that wicked, unjust judge would act on behalf of that widow? It is foolishness to ever assume that we, in any way, shape, or form, would be more moved towards justice than the just judge himself. That we would ever have a better understanding and demonstration of love than the God of love. That we could ever outdo God in His righteous acts and His goodness towards others. That our plan could ever be better than His. And he says this, like how much more would God not just act on behalf of a stranger, for this unjust judge. This was just some widow in the town who had a problem. He says, you're his elect. You're God's chosen people. Like, you're not some stranger he doesn't care about. You're his child he loves. And as a parent, you know, man, when my child comes to me, I care for them. I don't treat them the same way I treat some stranger. No, I welcome them into my presence, into my arms. I want to hear what they're struggling with, what they're concerned about. I want to know how I can help them. Even last night we were at an event and we were getting ready to leave and I saw my son walking towards me and I just saw his head hanging down. And I knew, because I know my son, something's wrong. So I went up to him, hey, what's going on, buddy? And we're walking to the car, nothing, and he, kind of walks so I'm like no 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 so I, I stopped him and I knelt down like what's going on you know he told me well I created a club tonight and the other kids left I'm like it's a tough life I know buddy you and me both no but it was a, it was a moment where I know my son and I know something's going on and any father who loves their child is not going to be like ah who cares he'll figure it out no you're going, what was it? I want to hear what's going on in your life. I want to know how I can help. I care about you. And Jesus here is saying, you're his chosen people. You're the elect. God chose you. He loves you. He knew you before you were even born. He knows every hair on your head. Some of you, that's a lot more than others. But he knows you. And he has thoughts towards you that are good. He desires to hear from you. Why would we not go to him? It's like that interaction with my son. God's pricking at your heart. Come to me. You're like, no, I'm fine. No, you're not. Come to me. I'll figure it out. No, I want to hear what's going on. He invites us to come into his presence. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. 
He invites you to come to Him. He wants to hear about it. Now, the enemy will try and tell you, you're annoying God. He's not, he's not interested. He's too busy for you. He doesn't want to hear from you after what you did. No, you couldn't possibly go to God. But that's not what we see Him saying. He says, come. You're His chosen people. And he says, how much more so? You think God's not going to avenge His elect who cry out day and night to Him? Our cries reach the ears of a God who hears them and is deeply moved by them. Do you remember the interaction of Moses in the wilderness with God through the burning bush? What does God say about the children of Israel who are in Egypt who are crying out to Him? Exodus 3, 7, And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. He's seen their oppression, he's heard their cry, and he knows their sorrows. Does that sound like a God that is distant and disconnected, that wants nothing to do with them? That sounds like a God that is extremely invested in their lives and their well-being. And he sees what's going on, and he hears how they are crying out to him, and he knows their sorrows, and he is acting on their behalf and saying, Moses, you've got to go back because I need to get my people out of there. And maybe some of you need to hear this this morning because you've been seeking the Lord and you've been crying out to Him and you feel like He doesn't see, He doesn't know, He doesn't care. Remember this from Exodus 3, that God sees your affliction, that God hears the cries of His people, that God understands, He knows your sorrows, and that God is acting on your behalf. And Jesus is reminding the disciples and us by extension, you're his chosen people. He loves you. He cares about you. He hears your cries. He sees what's going on. He cares deeply about it. He bears long with you. He's not annoyed by you. He's not frustrated by the persistence of your prayers. He's overjoyed. He's moved with compassion. He loves that you continually come and enter into His presence. And what is He doing on your behalf? Jesus says, I tell you, He will avenge them speedily. And I know you really want to question that because you've prayed about things a long time and you're like, I don't know what the original Greek for speedily means, but I think it probably means a really, really stinking long time because it does not feel like he's acted speedily in my situation. Maybe not in your timing. But God acts speedily on behalf of his people. Now, maybe the answer didn't come in the way you were looking for it. Maybe the answer has not come in the timing you thought would be best. But we're told here, by the words of Jesus, his very own mouth, God acts speedily on behalf of his people. So that's, that's a promise you could take to the bank. That's something you can have confidence in. He's not slack concerning his promises. So if someone's timeline's off, it's not God's. When I used to talk about this with the youth group, I would always say, you know, God's a lot like Gandalf. He r arrives precisely when He means to. He's never late. He's never early. He's right on time. He acts speedily, though, on behalf of His people. He will avenge you. He's not wasting time in hopes that you'll forget and stop asking. He's not dragging his feet. 
He's not lazy. He's a God who doesn't sleep nor slumber like we do. No, He's acting speedily on your behalf. And there's this emphasis within this, right? Luke made it clear from the beginning. Persistence in prayer. Continually be praying before the Lord. Don't lose heart. Be praying always. And if you know your Bible, on the surface, you can begin to get a little bit confused when you think about different texts that talk about prayer. Because Jesus in Matthew 6 talks a lot about prayer, but he tells us don't pray like the Pharisees. And they pray these long, exhaustive, fancy prayers, thinking that they'll be heard for the eloquence of their speech and this big public thing they do. Just don't pray like them. Go in private, be alone with the Lord. Pray simply. But here he says you need to persist in your prayer day and night before the Lord who hears you. He also says in in Matthew 6 that Jesus knows the things you're going to ask even before you ask them. He already knows the things going on. So you can begin to start asking the question, well, then why do I need to pray at all, and why do I need to pray continually? Like, what's the point? God already knows it before I say it. He acts speedily on my behalf, and He's told me I don't need to have these long, exhaustive prayers. So what am I supposed to do here? Is it a simple prayer, or is it a long one? Is is it one and done, or is it continual? Well, there's a couple things he's not saying, and then we'll talk about a few of the reasons he's calling us to persist in prayer. First, we do not persist in prayer to annoy God into answering our prayers. If you think that what Jesus is telling you to do here is pray 12 times a day for the same thing over and over and over, and if you keep doing it day after day, just like that judge, finally God's going to go, oh my gosh, all right, you can have it. That's not what he's saying. Secondly, we do not persist in prayer because God didn't hear us the first few times. It's not a bad connection. He didn't misunderstand you. You don't need to pray 12 times a day like, I just really want to make sure you got all the details there, okay? Because if, if you get any of these wrong, it could mean really different things in my life. And we do not persist in prayer because that makes God love you more. Or you are a better Christian if you pray more times a day. That's not what he's saying here. So then what is he saying? Why do we persist in prayer if he knew before we even asked it what we were going to ask for? Well, here's three reasons, three benefits to persisting in prayer. This isn't an exhaustive list but we don't have 45 more minutes, so we're going to combine this into three. First, the act of persisting in prayer is producing humility and surrender in you. Because the act of persisting in prayer means you are continually going to God with your problem and not trying to solve it on your own. It also means you're continually going to God with your problem and not looking to someone else to try and fix it for you. It's an act of humility because I can't fix it on my own. And it's an act of surrender that understands I actually don't have total control over this situation, but God does. So I'm going to humble myself, and I'm going to surrender to His plan, and I'm going to continually come before Him. And the moments I want to try and take matters into my own hands, nope, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to go back to the Lord in prayer. I'm going to humbly submit to Him. Oh, and the moment I feel like, oh, if I just talk to that person, I could probably figure out this whole thing. It would be solved. They could fix my problem. No, I'm not going to do that. Lord, I'm going to trust in you. I'm going to go back to you in prayer. I'm going to surrender to you. It's an act of humility and surrender. Instead of saying, well, I'm going to throw up a quick five-second prayer, and then I'm going to figure this out on my own. I'm going to reach out to those people. I'm going to manipulate situations, and I'm going to make the solution I want to have happen. That's not how it works. No, I'm not going to do that. Now, I want to make a note here. This does not mean you are void of responsibility and action when you pray. That doesn't mean that you just sit on your couch and you say, God, I need a job. All right, didn't get a job today. We'll try tomorrow. Go back to the couch tomorrow. God, I need a job. People are like, have you got a job yet? No. I don't know what God's doing, but, well, have you applied anywhere? No. No. 
Okay, well, that doesn't mean you're void of responsibility in this. But you're not trying to manipulate situations. You're not foolishly thinking that you have total control over everything that goes on in this world. No, we're responsible for our actions, and we're going to work diligently unto the Lord, but we're going to humble ourselves and surrender to His plan and His timing. Because guess what may happen? You pray to the Lord, please provide me a job, Lord. I need to provide, I need to pay rent. And then you go apply 12 places, and He provides a job, but it's not the one you want. Lord, that's not what I prayed for. That is not the, the wage I wanted to get. Those are not the people I want to work with. I really wanted option A, B, or C, and you're giving me option G. Can we, can we discuss? Can we have... No, I prayed for a job the Lord provided, and I'm humbly going to submit to His plan. I'm going to jump into that job. I'm going to take action. I'm going to be responsible, but I'm going to trust the Lord for the control. Okay, so first and foremost, we continue to persistently pray because it produces humility and surrender in us. Secondly, it strengthens your heart. What did he just say at the beginning of this? He shared this parable so they would continually pray and not lose heart. Psalm 27, 14 says, Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Do you know what can happen when you're continually praying about something and then you're looking around and you're not seeing anything change? Nothing seems like it's getting better. Maybe it seems like it's getting worse. You can grow weary. Your heart becomes weakened. You get discouraged. And if we're not careful, the tendency is, I'm going to stop praying because it doesn't seem like it's doing anything. But when we continually come to the Lord, He strengthens our heart. He reminds us He is a God who hears our prayers. He's a God who is working on our behalf. It reminds us of what we may not see, which is why Proverbs would tell you not to lean on your own understanding, to trust in the Lord. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He'll direct your paths. So we continually come back to him that he might strengthen our heart. Because if you pray once and then you go out in the world and you're looking around and you're seeing so much going on that is not according with his plan, not according to what you were praying for, not happening the way you thought it would, you can very quickly get discouraged. But when you go back to the Lord, you're reminded, okay, no, no, he's working. I may not see it. He's doing something. He is moving speedily, even if it doesn't feel like it. In Psalm 73, it's a psalm of Asaph and and he writes this, this whole account of, of looking around at the world and seeing the rich prosper and, and wondering, God, God, what are you doing? Why, why are the, the wicked prospering? And they seem like they don't have any cares in the world, but I'm struggling and I'm, my foot almost slipped and I'm about to give in. And he says, until I went into the sanctuary of the Lord and then I knew their end. There was this discouragement. There was this weakening of his heart and this frailty within his spirit, but then he goes into the sanctuary of the Lord and he enters into that place and he's reminded that God is in control. He's reminded of the sacrifice that takes place. He's reminded of the end of all of this and what's going to come after and his heart is strengthened. Do you know what he says in that same chapter? My heart and my flesh might fail, but God is the strength of my heart, my portion forever. Oh man, my heart was failing. My flesh was failing But I went into the sanctuary of the Lord and I was reminded, God is the strength of my heart. He's my portion forever. I'm not going to trust in just what I see or I feel. And the third reason we should persist in prayer, it draws you into the presence of God. When we're repeatedly coming to Him with our problems, our concerns, and our needs, we find in Him the all-sufficient one, the one who has a plan to work out our problems together for our good and His glory, the one who can sympathize with our situation, whose grace is sufficient for us, whose power is made perfect in our weakness. We find Him who, unlike the just judge, 
helped a woman so that he might be rid of her, God deeply desires that we would abide in him, that we would enter into his presence where there is fullness of joy, that we would come to him when we are weary and heavy laden. And as we come to him, we gain so much more than just help with our problem. We gain him, more of him, less of us more of his mindset, more of his timing, more of his heart for the situation, more of his eyes to see it through his perspective, and less of our own. Because at its core, prayer is not about information, it's about transformation. It's less about you getting an answer from God, a solution to your problem, the right next step to take. It's a lot more about God doing a work of transforming you through the renewing of your mind. It's not about getting something from Him. It's about being molded more into His image. So we go to prayer seeking God's face before we seek His hand. Right? Seeking His presence before we seek His provision. God, first and foremost, I enter into prayer just to be with you not just to get something from you. This is not just about a transaction taking place. This is a relationship where I just want to be in your presence. Because our deepest need is that he would do a work within us, not just a work around us. God, change my heart in this situation. Maybe I'm looking at this all wrong, God. Maybe I've been praying all wrong about this, and I've been asking you to do this, and actually it's just a problem with me, and you just need to change my heart to be more like yours. You just need to open my eyes so I could see this differently. How many times later on could you go back to the Lord and thank Him because He didn't give you what you were praying for? Right? Some of you are praising the Lord today that you're not married to that person. You prayed that you would be married to. Oh, man, thank you, Lord, for not answering that prayer. I prayed, I begged you, I tried to negotiate. I, oh, Lord, I will serve you all my days. I'll do anything. Just let me marry this person. And now you're saying, Lord, thank you so much that you did not give me what I asked for. Some of you in a situation were saying, God, will you please give me this opportunity, this job, will you take me here? Will you help me make this much? And he did something completely different. And you're thinking, man, that was so much better than my plan. My plan would have led me here. You took me there, 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 and there. And I got to see you work in the midst of that. And I got to see all these new ways that you're doing things. And you worked out things in me. He does so much more. And that's who he is, the God who does exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask. So we don't enter into his presence saying, all right, here's what you need to do for me. I've got a whole plan laid out. I need you to act here. I need you to provide that. I need you to do this at this time. And if as long as you do this, 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 and this, everything is going to work out perfectly. For you, what about the other billions of people on the planet? What about God's plan that's been going on since the beginning of time? Have you you taken that into consideration or was this just, if you do A, B, and C, my life's going to be more comfortable, I'm going to have more money, my family's going to be healthy, and everything's going to go smooth. I don't see that in his call for disciples. When he says, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. When he says, all who desire to live godly lives will suffer persecution. And this this gets to really the, the main question he asks at the end. It's not a question of, does God care? Is God acting? Is God able? Is God listening? The real question, Jesus points it right back to them. Will God actually find faith on earth? Do you actually have the faith that believes God's plan is better than your own? 
and that He is acting on your behalf and that He is capable and that He does hear you. That's the real question. It's not about God's ability. It's about our faith. Will we be people, even when we don't see what He's doing, that will continue to come to God with our concerns, that will trust Him to avenge us, and that don't grow weary or lose heart of that pursuit. As I invite the worship team to come back up, the question we should be asking is what might cause us to lose heart in our prayers? Right? He He shared this parable so that they would continually be praying and not lose heart. Sometimes we lose heart because we don't get the answer we want. Sometimes we lose heart because we don't get the answer in the time we want it. Sometimes we lose heart because maybe we got the answer we wanted, maybe we got it in the time we wanted it, but maybe we got it in a, through a means we didn't believe was the best means. Do you know all of that can be summarized as, in, in one word, control? One of the main reasons we lose heart is because we don't have control, and we want it. When we feel like we can't change the outcome, we give up because we see no way of positively bringing about change, and yet He tells you very clearly the one thing that is within your control is that you can come to me in prayer, and you can be confident that the God who sees your situation, who hears your prayer, will act speedily on your behalf in the best way possible. There's no question about it. And you know, God has been um, percolating an example that I could use, an illustration for the last year and a half. Um, I was given a motorcycle about a year and a half ago from someone. It wasn't running. It was kind of in pieces. And, and a friend of mine helped me get that thing started. And when I mean a friend helped me, I mean I sat there and watched him put this thing together and get this thing running. Um, but we got this motorcycle running and I was thrilled. And the last step I had was I just had to go get a title for it. That's it. It's one small little thing. It didn't have a title. I mean, it was in pieces. It hadn't been registered in like 20 years. So it's, it's simple. And so I was given a, a, a list of steps from, from DMV, um, what I had to get, what I had to do. And then I'll get my title. No problem. Go get all those steps done. Come back. Oh, we're sorry. Actually, we didn't realize this was registered 21 years ago in Oregon to somebody, so now you have to find the original owner, and you have to get them to release the liability so that you can... Oh, okay, so there's another step. Okay, well, can you give me the information of that owner? Well, Oregon DMV has that. Okay, well, do you have a connection? No, we don't talk to Oregon DMV. I'm like, well, you should start because <laughs> you guys kind of do the same thing in a different state. So... Now I have to contact Oregon DMV, Oregon DMV and have a conversation and explain the whole thing and then finally get an insurance company that got the bike in a claim and I need to contact them. And so, you know, five conversations later, we get to the right person who, who says, oh, we sold that to a salvage company we, and we, we're not liable for it. And I'm like, okay, well, you are. So how can we solve it? Well, no, 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 we sold it. We're not like, well... DMV thinks you are, so how can we work this out? No, we're, it's not in our name. Okay, so I go back to DMV. They're not going to do a release liability. They don't even think it's in their name. And they go, well, uh, yeah, they will. And I'm like, but they won't. Um, so this conversation goes back and forth, and they go, no, you've got to get a release of liability from them. There's, there's nothing else you can do. So I go back to them, look, you've really got to help me out, and I'm, I'm talking to different people, and, and they're like, we don't feel comfortable giving you release of liability. I'm like, I don't even know how I could scam you if I'm trying to get you to release liability from something you think you released the liability of, but um, 
And so then I go back to DMV, and I'm like, what do you need as proof that they won't do it? And they said, something written. I said, does an email work? An email will work. So I email them, and I say, I just need an email saying you don't feel comfortable releasing the liability of this. They said, we don't feel comfortable doing that. I'm like, you don't feel comfortable with anything. So then I send another email to a different email account. They send me an email saying, we don't feel comfortable. We're not going to release liability. I'm like, this might be enough. And I go back to DMV and they say, that'll work. That's written. It's from them. They say they won't do it. And I was like, it's done. So I send it all in the mail. I have to, they, you have to send in the mail to Oregon. Gets there. Comes back. I'm so excited. I open the mailbox. I get the paper. And this was a real embarrassing, humbling moment for me to admit. But I forgot to sign the check paying for it. So truth be told, this is one of the first checks I've ever written in my life. That tells you a little bit about me. But I didn't sign the check. So I signed the check quickly, put it all back in the mail, send it off again, wait three weeks, comes back in the mail. I'm so thrilled. I open it up. I didn't check a box. So I checked the box and I mail it away. And true story, we are still waiting in the mail to see what happens when it gets back. But here was the most frustrating part of this entire process is that every time I talk to a different person and every time I need to share this story all over again and it is so disheartening when you don't know who's going to pick up. I don't know if they care because in my experience there are two different kinds of people uh, that work for DMV. There are those who see you as their friends and they see the system as the enemy and they are going to help you find a way to get through this enemy. There's another group, and they're more commonly who I get, who see the system as the friend, and you are the enemy, and you are trying to get through their defense, and they will find any and every way to stop you from getting through. Well, it is, <laughs> you know. So the struggle is, when I call, who am I going to get? Are they going to even care? In fact, I pleaded with a woman one time. Before I even started, I said, I've been on the phone with countless people for countless hours. I just need to know you care. And if you don't, I won't be offended. I will hang up and I will call right back and get someone else. <laughs> but I need to know before we even go down this road that you care and you're going to actually try and help because you need to make my problem your own. And you need to help me find a solution. And you know what? This lady said, I care. I'm going to help you find a solution. The day before, I got a guy who didn't care, and it became very apparent very quickly. So she helps me. She gives me paperwork. She tells me, you need this form. You're going to go to this website. This is what you're going to do. I'm taking notes. And that's what's got me to what I think is pretty close to getting a title. I could be wrong. This will be a great illustration next year for perseverance. But... But the confidence you and I have, let's bring this home, we're getting out of control here. The confidence you and I have this morning is that when you go to the Lord in prayer, it's not like me calling up DMV. You know exactly who's going to pick up on the other side. And you don't have to question whether or not he cares about your situation. He is deeply concerned with it. And as much as it bothers you, it bothers him more. And as much as you are moved with compassion and love and you want to see justice, you better believe he loves that person more than you do. He is more committed to justice than you will ever be. And he is more in control of the situation than you ever were. And so we go to him with a confidence. I don't have to wonder, God, if you're going to give me wrong information. God, I don't have to wonder if your reply in the mail someday is going to come back and say, sorry, we didn't get that, uh, we go before a God and we can be confident. He hears when you pray. He deeply loves you. He's going to act speedily on your behalf. But the question he's asking you is, do you have faith to believe it? Will you continue to persist in your prayer? Will you not lose heart in the midst of it? I'll just close with this, Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Seeing that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, 
Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne room of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace in times of need. That widow came to the throne of an unjust judge who didn't care or fear God. But we come before a throne of grace with a great high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses, who offers mercy and grace to help in our time of need. God helps because of his great love for us, because he desires to hear from us, and because he loves to give good gifts to his children. And thanks be to God that we have a mediator who cares about us, understands our struggle, has a solution for our problems, and calls us to enter into prayer, to persist in it, and to hold fast to the promises of who it is we're coming to and what it is he promises to do on our behalf. And when you cast your cares upon him, when you don't allow yourself to be anxious about anything, but in everything, bring your prayers and requests to God, he promises that the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So this morning, we're going to enter into a time of worship and a time of prayer. And there'll be people in the front of the room and upstairs in the back who would love to pray for you, who would love to pray with you. Now, if you don't want to make the walk, if, if, if you're intimidated to do so, then tap on the shoulder of the person next to you and they can pray for you. I have volunteered them and they're ready. But let's be people this morning who, who are serious about taking everything to God in prayer. Was the hymn say, oh, what peace we often forfeit, oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. What are you carrying this morning that you need to just give to the Lord? What worry, what struggle, what frustration, what bitterness, what concern do you need to leave at the foot of the cross and trust that God's got it? He sees, he knows exactly what's going on, Bring it to him. Let him change your heart. Let him transform your mind. Let him give you that peace as you leave today. And I want to ask if there's anybody in the room in this moment who doesn't know that God we're talking about personally. And this morning, you need to make the decision to give your life to Jesus. See, the comfort we have that he hears our prayers, that he will answer. That's the comfort we have as his children who have given our lives to him. But the only prayer he wants to hear from the person who doesn't know him is one of repentance and surrender. One that recognizes your need for salvation and calls upon him. So this morning, if you do not know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, you've got an opportunity right now to make that decision. We would ask you to either stand up where you are or to raise your hand up so we can pray for you. And that's a decision no one can make for you. But if you this morning know, I haven't given my life to Jesus and surrender, and I want to, you have an opportunity right now before we close. Is there anybody that needs to do that? right then church let us enter into worship let us be serious and intentional about prayer and as God puts things in your heart don't leave them there go to someone pray with someone allow someone else to be brought into the midst of that situation and let's leave here with peace and confidence knowing there's a God who sees who cares who hears and who acts speedily on our behalf. Amen. Amen. Let's stand. God, we thank you for that confidence we have this morning in your word. 
Lord, would you forgive us for the times we have a lost heart, for the times our prayers have ceased. God, I've said it many times and I believe it to be true that if we really wanna see revival in this church, in this world, it's gonna start in prayer. That the most important service we could ever hold as a church is the prayer service. And Lord, unfortunately, in most places in the world, and we're no exception, it's the smallest gathering we'll ever have is the prayer meeting. God, would you humble us in this moment where we think we're in control and we're not, where we think we have a better plan and we don't, where we have doubted what you're doing. You're a good heavenly father who loves us more than we could ever imagine. And God, I pray that we leave here today not with condemnation, not in shame because I didn't pray enough this week, but motivated by a loving God who invites us in and that we would be moved towards prayerfulness. Not just because we have a lot of problems, though we do, But God, we just want to be in your presence. We want to sit at your feet. We want to be shaped more into your image. So Lord, would your Holy Spirit stir in us a greater hunger and thirst for prayer. God, I pray that this church would be known as a house of prayer. God, I pray that you would overflow the prayer meetings that go on in this place. Lord, that we would need a bigger building just to fit the prayer group because we so believe in the power of coming before a God who is in control. And Lord, would that start here and now this morning as we enter into worship and prayer. And it's in your name, Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, Amen.